examples uh, by looking at several examples and then uh, to conveniently obtain the Fourier transform after time uh, domain operations, we learned a set of properties of Fourier transform, uh, time scaling, time shifting, uh, differentiation, integration, as well as passive wells relation, which is related to the integral of a magnitude square of signal, which is called energy of a signal. Uh, here, uh, let me add some content to uh, Wednesday lecture. The first is a remark about this notion of energy for a signal. Right? We call the magnitude square and taking integral the energy of a signal x of t. Here I quote a paragraph from Wikipedia. I attach the link to the full text. But the paragraph said energy in the context of signals, uh, signal systems it is not exactly the same as the conventional notion of energy in physics, say the energy you learn, the kinetic energy or the electric energy you learned in physics. But the two concepts are closely related and can be converted from one to the other in some context. Uh, here I give you one simple example. Let's consider uh, a circuit, a direct current circuit, and we have a impedance with, which is constant constant impedance R, there is some current flowing through that impedance and it's time varying. Uh, let's denote this current as I of T and it always flows in one direction, which means I of T can have time varying magnitude but always flows in one direction, does not altern, alternate its direction. Then we define a signal X of T, which is I of t scaled by a constant, square root of r. Then in this case, if you look at this integral, uh, x of t magnitude square dt from minus infinity to plus infinity, it is i square r dt over time, over all the time t. We learned from physics that i square r, i square of t times r is the instantaneous power at time t. And if we take the integral of power over time t, it is the energy that is dissipated on this impedance in the form of heat. So that is one interpretation of the energy of a signal. And then another content I would like to add to the differentiation and the integration property, because last week some student some students asked how to derive the integration property. So this one, this property in the blue box. Uh, I decided to uh, explain this derivation in class because it involves the Fourier transform of several special uh, specific signals that are of interest. Uh, to derive the property uh, for this uh, integral of x, uh, we need to prepare uh, several steps. The first preparation is to calculate the Fourier transform of this signal. Uh, it's called the signum signal. So this signal looks like this, and it takes value minus one when t is less than zero, takes value positive one when t is larger than zero. So we need first calculate the Fourier transform of this signal. And it turns out that if we want to calculate the Fourier transform of signum signal directly using the definition of Fourier transform, then it involves the integration over a infinite interval for a pure imaginary exponent, which is not, uh, which is not integrable. Therefore, to calculate this Fourier transform, we need to play a trick. We need to approximate this signal with exponential signals. So in particular, this signal signal can be expressed as u of t, the unit step, minus u of minus t, the time reflection of unit step, right? because the time reflection is value one on the left, and then minus the time reflection is minus one on the left. 
and we approximate u of t with exponential minus a t u of t. We know that this exponential signal, when a is positive, it decays as t increases to infinity. But if we let a to be infinitely smaller, then it is decaying at a slower and slower rate. When a is infinitely close to zero, it the, ex, the exponential signal looks infinitely close to a flat signal, to a flat step u of t. And similarly, we can approximate u of minus t by multiplying exponential a t. So exponential a t, when t is less than zero, it increases as t, it increases from zero to one as t increases from minus zero to, uh, to from minus infinity to zero. But again, as a is infinitely close to zero, exponential a t is increasing at a infinitely flat rate, or it looks infinitely close to a flat step. So that's the approximation. Why is approximation useful? We can see it from calculating the Fourier transform on the first term. Let's now calculate Fourier transform of exponential minus a t u of t using the standard definition. It should be integration from minus infinity to plus infinity. However, because of this step signal u of t, which takes value zero when t is negative, we can reduce the integration interval. We can take the integration from zero because everything less than zero, the value is zero. So that's not affect the integral. And then we can merge these two exponential as one term. We know how to calculate its integral. Just put a put the coefficient in the denominator and take the difference between lower upper limit for the exponential on the numerator. And for a positive, so at this time, we still consider a to be a positive number. We haven't taken the limit yet. For a positive, when t goes to infinity, this exponential goes to zero. Therefore, the first term in the numerator is zero. The second term, when taking t is zero, the second term is one. So we calculate the Fourier transform of the first term. And we can calculate the Fourier transform of the second term in a similar way. So for the second term, because we have u of minus t, then the integration interval is from minus infinity to zero. I can calculate the exponential in the numerator in the same way, get the value which looks very similar to the first term, but this is plus, this is minus. Then we apply the linearity property to the Fourier transform of the signal signal. So basically the Fourier transform is the Fourier transform of first term minus Fourier transform of second term. Fourier transform of first term, Fourier transform of second term. And don't forget that for signum signal, we need to let A to be infinitely small, uh, infinitely close to zero. So this zero plus means A approaches zero from the positive direction. So A is positive and then approaches zero. And we calculate this part, which is a uh, dependent on both omega and a, but as we let a goes to zero, this a squared term just disappear. So after a little bit elimination, we have the function two divided by j omega, which is the Fourier transform of this signal signal. That's the first preparation we made to prove this integration property. The next preparation, is to calculate the Fourier transform of another signal. This signal is constantly one for all the time t. So how to calculate Fourier transform of this signal? Again, if we apply the standard Fourier transform formula, uh, the integration turns out uh, not straightforward to calculate. But we can check the uh, Fourier transform of this signal by applying the inverse Fourier transform. So it turns out the Fourier transform of this constant signal is two pi times impulse delta of omega. And we can check it by applying the inverse Fourier transform, which is the integration of x j omega, exponential j omega t d omega. Right. 
just replace active J omega with this two pi times impulse, two pi and one over two pi cancel each other. And for the rest of the integration, we know how to calculate integration with uh, delta inside. Just exponential J omega T, where omega takes the value, the location, the impulse occurs. The, lo the impulse delta omega occurs at omega equals zero, so we replace omega inside the exponential j omega t with zero, which is one. So it says that for the signal x t equals one, for every t, the Fourier transform is two pi delta omega. Uh, by the way, this result is kind of a symmetric to the result we learned last, last lecture. Last lecture, we learned that if we have an impulse in the time domain, then its Fourier transform is constantly one over the frequency domain omega. And this, today we learned this result, says that if the signal is constant in time, dom time domain, then its Fourier transform is impulse in frequency domain, except that we need to add this coefficient two pi. Yeah. So there is this, mutual symmetric structure between constant signal and impulse. So one is in the time domain that the other is in the frequency domain. So they are related with, uh, with Fourier and the inverse Fourier transforms. Okay, this is the second preparation we made for the proof of this integration property. Then we need a third preparation which combines the preparation one and two. The third preparation is to calculate the Fourier transform of U of T. Actually, we calculated Fourier transform of U of T last lecture by applying this integration property. But indeed, because here our goal is to derive the integration property itself, then we need to calculate the Fourier transform of U of T in a different way, in a more fundamental way. And this is where the first two preparations are useful. We can express U of T as one over two plus one over two, the signum signal. Because the signum signal, if we look at its figure, is from minus one to one. If we multiply it by one over two, then it is compressed along the vertical axis. In other words, it is from minus one half to one half on the vertical axis. And then we add additional one over two, then the signal is raised up by one over two. So it ranges from zero to one on the vertical axis. And by applying the linearity, we can calculate the Fourier transform U of T, which is a Fourier transform of the first term and the Fourier plus the Fourier transform second term. Fourier transform first term, we already know that if we have constant signal one, its Fourier transform is two pi delta omega. Then if we have constant signal one over two, just multiply it by one. For the Fourier transform signal signal, in preparation one, we derived that it is two divided by J omega. And then since there is additional one over two, so the result is one divided by J omega. So one divided by J omega plus pi times delta omega is the Fourier transform of the unit step you can compare it with the result we obtained the last lecture using a different method, one over j omega plus pi delta omega, which is the same. Okay, with these three preparations, we can now come to the proof of this integration property. We want to calculate the Fourier transform of the integral of x tau. So the Fourier transform of this integral just place this integral in the standard formula for Fourier transform. So this integral is a function of t, right? After taking the integral, tau disappears, and the result depends on the upper limit t, so it's a function of t. A function of t, exponential minus j omega t dt, that's the Fourier transform for this function. The first step, we change the upper limit from t to plus infinity to make sure that this change does not affect the result of this integral, we need to multiply additional step signal u of t minus tau. 
So u of t minus tau, if you look at it on the time axis tau, so the vertical axis is tau, then it is a reflected version of the standard unit step and then shifted by t. So it's reflected, so it is one on the left. It is shifted by t, so it jumps at t instead of at zero. But because of this signal u of t minus tau, everything to the left of t is retained without any change because it takes value, it multiplies one. Everything to the right of t is eliminated. Therefore, this integral, although it's upper limit plus infinity, but it equals this integral on the last step whose upper limit is t. Uh, this is the first transformation we make. And then the integration in the, the inner integration, so we have two loops of integrations. The inner loop of integration is for time variable tau. Now the next step, we flip the inner loop to the outer loop and put the outer loop inside. So we, change, we put dt inside, put d tau outside. So everything inside should contain time variable t, right? u of t minus tau, exponential minus j omega t. So exponential minus j omega t is put in, in the inner integral now. And everything outside should contain the time variable tau. So x of tau is now for the outer integral. d tau is in the outer integral. So what is this thing in the black, in the square brackets? So what is this inner integral? This inner integral is the Fourier transform of the signal u of t minus tau because it just applies the standard formula of a Fourier transform, right? We understand the u of t minus tau as a signal of t, then multiplies exponential j omega t dt. It is a Fourier transform of this signal. And it has a relationship with the Fourier transform of u of t. The relationship is that u of t minus tau is the time shift of u of t by tau. Here we can apply the time shift property of Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of u of t minus tau is the Fourier transform of u of t multiplies exponential j omega t0, where t0 equals tau is the shifted amount. And in the preparation three step we just reviewed, we know that a Fourier transform of u over t is this thing, right? One over j omega please plus omega. So this is the Fourier transform of u of t minus tau. We just replace this whole part inside of the square brackets with the Fourier transform of u of t minus tau with this result written in, uh, written in red. Uh, exponential j omega minus j omega tau, this function of omega d tau. And we can put this function of omega outside of this outer integration because it has nothing to do with the integration variable tau. Then what is left inside the integration is again a Fourier transform. So x of tau exponential minus j omega tau d tau. It's just a Fourier transform of x of t or a Fourier transform of x of tau. They are equal because after Fourier transform, it is only a function of omega, right? X, capital X of j omega. So capital X of j omega times this result in the first part, it is this. Already looks much similar to the right-hand side of the property we want to prove. But there's one more step that we can go the second term is x of j omega times delta omega. We know that delta omega is an impulse that occurs at omega equals zero. But for everywhere else, for omega not equal zero, delta omega just is zero. And therefore, it doesn't matter what is the value of capital X j omega if elsewhere omega is not zero. The only thing that affects 
the second term is the value of x of j omega at omega equals zero. So we can take omega equals zero in the capital X term. What we obtain is exactly the same as the right-hand side of the Fourier transform. So from the beginning, we want to calculate Fourier transform of this integration. At the end, we get the right-hand side, and then we finish proof for this property. So this is a very long proof, but I would say the proof itself is not that important. Uh, in your exam, in your homework, you just need to know how to apply this property. That's why I said the proof is for interest, not required to learn. But the method during the uh, proof procedure, those several preparations uh, involving the Fourier transform calculation methods of several special signals that are good for you to understand. Uh, basically, it is applying the integration techniques in different contexts. Now, let's continue the uh, study of uh, properties of Fourier transform. Last lecture, we stop at this example which is another application of integration property. We have this signal x of t, which is the triangular waveform. And actually we can write the expression of x of t by different cases. For t between zero and one, it is a segment with a slope positive one. So it has a t term. And then plus constant term one, because when t equals zero, x of t takes value one. So we can check this special intercept, intercept at vertical axis. And then for t from zero to one, the intercept does not change. So it's still plus one, but the slope is changed to minus one. That's why we have minus t. Everywhere else, x of t is zero. So what is the Fourier transform of this signal x of t? Of course, we can calculate by applying the standard formula of Fourier transform. But this time, let's practice using the integration property. So we have a signal g of t, and the integration of g of tau, d tau, from minus infinity to t is x of t. So you can check it rigorously by deriving the equations yourself. But the intuition is that if g of t, which, is, which looks like this, we take its integral from minus infinity. So for t less than minus one, we are taking the integral of constant zero. So the result x of t is also zero. But from the point minus one, the integral increases at a rate one. So it so on x of t, it ramps up at rate one. And after point zero, it decreases at rate minus one. So it decreases at rate minus one. And then after point t equals one, the increase and decrease amount just cancel each other. So x of t returns to zero. So g of t looks like this. Its expression is simpler for t between minus one to zero, it takes value one. For t between zero and one, it takes my value minus one. It's a combination of two square wave forms. And to apply the integration property, we need to first calculate the Fourier transform of g of t. And to calculate Fourier transform of this signal, we can further apply a Fourier transform of a signal we already know which is the standard square waveform. And we know that for this signal, its Fourier transform is two times sine divided by omega. So now as a practice, please try to calculate the Fourier transform of G of T from this previous result, applying the time shift and linearity property. Uh, let's have uh, one minute for this practice.
Okay. So g of t, we can first express it as g1 of t minus g2 of t, where g1 of t is a positive square waveform centered at minus one half. g2 of t is a positive square waveform centered at a positive one half. Because of this minus sign between g1 and g2 uh, in g of t, so this positive part becomes negative. Now, the Fourier transform of g1 of t just apply the time shift property, multiplying the previous result with exponential j omega one over two. Right? Because it's, it should be min exponential minus j omega t zero, but for g1 of t, we are shifting g zero of t to the left. In that case, t zero is minus one over two. So two minus sign cancel each other. That's why for G1 of T, it has exponential plus J omega one over two in its result. For G2 of T, it's a shift on the other direction. So it is exponential minus J omega divided by two. And the Fourier transform of G of T denoted by capital G of J omega is just a capital G1 minus capital J to G2. The common part to sign omega divided by two divided by omega is the same. And the only difference between G1 and G2 are the two exponential terms. And for this exponential difference, we know that we can simplify it using the corollary of Euler's formula, 2J sine omega divided by two. It turns out the result, it turns out the Fourier transform of G of T is 4J sine square omega divided by two then divided by omega. When we come back to the ultimate goal of this problem, which is the Fourier transform of x of t, because x of t is the integration with g, then capital X is this formula of capital G. We can substitute capital G we just calculated above. So the first term is this 4j sine square divided by j ohm, divided by omega and then divided by j omega. So there are two omega on the two omegas on the denominator. And for the second term, it is related to capital G zero. So what is capital G zero? We take the limit of this result for omega approaching zero but both numerator and denominator are zero in this case. So how do we calculate the limit? We can again apply the optical rule, which says we can take the derivative of the numerator with respect to omega, take the derivative of the denominator with respect to omega, and then take the limit for both derivatives as omega goes to zero. For the denominator, we take in derivative, the result is just one, which is non-zero, so we are happy. For the numerator, after taking the derivative, because it's sine square, then the derivative still contains a sine omega divided by two term, which is zero when omega goes to zero. Therefore, we are looking at a fractional number whose numerator is zero, whose denominator is one, the result is zero. Since G zero equals one, it eliminates the second term. So the second term is just zero. We just retain the first term. And after a little bit simplification, it tells us it's four times sine square divided by omega square, which is the Fourier transform of capital X. Now let's look at a new property. So last lecture, and so far what we've been training for is this, uh, property associated with time domain derivative. If we look at dx dt on the time domain, what is its Fourier transform? Then we can also take the derivative on the frequency domain, which means capital X of j omega is a function of omega, and the omega is a continuous frequency. We can also take the derivative of capital X over omega, so d capital X, d omega. Then it's a inverse Fourier transform. 
in the time domain is just multiplying the origin signal x of t with additional minus jt. But there is kind of symmetry in this pair of properties. So dx dt is Fourier transform is capital X multiplying j omega. And dx d, d capital X d omega is inverse Fourier transform is x times minus jt. So how to derive this property? So we start from x of j omega, which is calculated from the standard Fourier transform formula, x of t exponential minus j omega t dt. Then we take the derivative over omega on both sides. So notice that we are taking the derivative over omega. We are not taking the derivative over j omega. But j is a constant. We write J in this bracket just as a convention, but at the end of the day, capital X only has a variable omega. That's why we take its derivative over omega. And then we take a derivative over omega on the right-hand side under certain mathematical conditions, which we assume always holds, we can move the d d omega inside the integral. And since inside the integral, variable omega only appears in this exponential term. So we only take the derivative of omega for this exponential term. The exponential term after taking derivative is retained and with additional coefficient of minus jt. So minus jt is the coefficient in front of omega. And this is the Fourier transform of this time domain signal underlined by red. So it's a Fourier transform for minus jt x of t. Yes, there is a minus sign when we apply the second property. Don't forget this minus sign. So the first property, there is no minus sign. Okay, let's look at the application of this property. We have this signal x of t is exponential minus a t times u of t for some positive number a larger than zero. So calculate is Fourier transform. Uh, of course, we can uh, apply the standard Fourier transform formula. But here, uh, yeah, now let's just look at the standard calculation, x of t exponential minus j omega t dt, which is the same as the preparation one I show at the beginning of this class. So I will now repeat, just the result is one over a plus j omega. Okay, so why I start with this example? Because from this example, we can derive some uh, more useful property, some more useful uh, formulas. We take the derivative of this particular capital X of j omega. I take a derivative of one over a plus j omega. Uh, applying the chain rule when taking derivative. So minus one a plus j omega square. And since we are taking derivative over omega, then don't forget this additional coefficient j. This is d capital x d omega and applying the frequency domain differentiation property. When we take the derivative of capital X over d omega, then its inverse Fourier transform is the original time domain signal multiplies minus jt. What is the original signal? It is exponential minus a t u of t. So on the left hand side, the exponential minus a t u t need to multiply a additional minus j. T. So it's th the Fourier transform of this signal is d x d omega, which is this, d x d omega. And because of linearity, then we can cancel j omega on both sides. Uh, so we can cancel minus j on both sides. t times exponential minus a t u of t is its Fourier transform is one over a plus j omega squared. And we can further 
extend this result by taking the derivative of the right-hand side again. We take the dd omega on the right-hand side. And the right-hand side now is a plus j omega to the power minus two. Then after taking another derivative, it is minus two a plus j omega to the power minus three. And don't forget this additional coefficient j applying the chain rule. Again, applying this frequency domain differentiation property, when we take the derivative of right-hand side, the left-hand side need to multiply an additional minus jt. So the original left-hand side is t exponential minus at blah, blah, and then we multiply it with additional minus jt. Again, we eliminate the minus j factor on both sides. So on the left-hand side, we have this t square exponential minus at multiplies something. And on the right-hand side, it is one divided by a plus j omega to the power of three. And notice that this two is divided to the left-hand side. Still holds because of the linearity property. Now you can imagine that we can extend this result for taking the further derivatives, the higher order derivatives of the right-hand side and multiplying additional minus jt's on the right-hand side. And we get a general law. What this general law says, if we have this signal, so it's t to the power n minus one divided by n minus one factorial multiplies exponential minus a t for some constant, positive constant a, u of t, which is the standard unit step signal. This kind of signal on the time domain is Fourier transform is one over a plus j omega to the power n on the frequency domain. So later, you will see how this property is useful. So now we've finished the study of uh, integration differentiation properties. Uh, we put a lot of time on these pair of properties because uh, they are very important. And they also laid a foundation for the uh, properties of Fourier transform that are, can be applied to linear time environment system. And to apply Fourier transform to a uh, linear time environment system, we must also learn this convolution property. It says the following. We have two signals over on the time domain. One is x of t, one is h of t. And their Fourier transform are respectively capital X and capital H. Then if we have a new signal, which is x of t, a convolution with h of t. So we know that if we have two signals, this convolution is still a signal on the time domain. But if we perform Fourier transform on this convolution, the result on the frequency domain is capital X times capital H. So this x h on the right hand side just means we multiply the, re, the, the value of the signal for every particular omega, so point wise over omega. Okay, why is it useful? Uh, you will see it later. Uh, we will later come to LTI system, then you will see why it's useful. So, but let's first look at the proof of this property. So we want to calculate the Fourier transform of x convoluting h. Then apply the standard formula. X convolution with H, we learned in chapter two, is X tau H T minus tau D tau from minus infinity to plus infinity. After taking the integral, tau disappears. So what is inside the square brackets is a signal of T. The signal of T multiplies exponential minus J omega T D T is a Fourier transform of this convolution signal, okay? We adjust a little bit the locations of the different components. Again, we put dt in the inner integral. Everything with the variable t should be kept in the inner integral. It include, includes h of t minus tau because it contains t, exponential minus j omega t because it's a function of t. Those are all in the inner integral. What is left for the outer integral is d tau with x of tau. 
from x of tau d tau is now flipped outside. Let's at this time focus on uh, the blue part. So h of t minus tau exponential minus j omega t dt, it's an integration over t. So we can first extract a exponential minus j omega tau outside of this integral because tau is now related to the integral. But because of this coefficient, we need to make sure that the value does not change. There is additional exponential minus j omega tau that needs to be multiplied. That's why this t becomes t minus tau. That's to balance this additional coefficient. Why we write it in this form? Because we can make a variable substitution. Just define t minus tau as a new symbol s. So h of s, we can replace t minus tau with s. Exponential minus j omega s. dt and ds are the same because tau is now considered constant value in this particular integral. Of course, when we change variable from t to s, we need to change the lower upper limit of integration as well. But the lower upper limit turns out to be minus infinity minus tau, which is still minus infinity. And the plus infinity minus tau, which is still plus infinity, turns out they are not changed. And what is this integration? It's h of s exponential minus j omega s ds. But if we change everywhere from s to t, the integration itself does not change. It's still the same function of omega, which is the capital H of j omega, the Fourier transform of H. So the blue part turns out to be capital H multiplies exponential minus j omega tau. We apply this result on the last page, replace the blue part in the square brackets with this result. Uh, exponential minus j omega tau times capital H, then we have this, right? Again, we start from calculating the Fourier transform of a convolution. And now we are at this point where we have tau here, I have tau here. H of j omega is not related to the integration variable tau, so we can put it outside of the integration. What is left inside the integration? Again, it is the standard formula for Fourier transform of X. So it's capital X. Capital X times capital H is the Fourier transform of the convolution of X and H. Why is this property useful? Now let's jump to the next part, application to our STI system. I have one minute, so let me cast the main result. Given an LTI system, uh, and also given its unit in pulse response H of T, how do we determine output signal Y of T for input signal X of T? There are three methods. Method one, we learned from last chapter, which is Fourier series, but it's only applicable to, only applicable to, uh, only applicable to the uh, periodic signal. So this is the Fourier series. And then method two can be applied to general signals, whether it is periodic or not. That's to calculate the convolution directly in the time domain. But we know that convolution can be complicated to calculate, right? It takes perhaps half an hour to calculate a convolution with two signals. Then method three is what we learn in this chapter. We can apply Fourier transform for general signal X of T, whether it is periodic or not. And this is where the convolution property is useful. Since Y of T is the convolution of X and H, why not we first take the Fourier transform of both x and h. Then in the frequency domain, we can directly multiply capital X and the capital H. So the multiplication is more straightforward to calculate than the convolution. 
after this direct and standard multiplication, we get y of j omega, which is the Fourier transform of y of t, and namely the Fourier transform of x convolution at h. And then y of t in the time domain is just the inverse Fourier transform of capital Y. So the complexity of this calculation is transferred from the calculation of convolution to the calculation of Fourier transforms and the inverse Fourier transform. So next lecture, we will look at some examples how to apply this result. Uh, this is the lecture today uh, from 10.30, we will have the TA tutorial. Okay, see you next Wednesday.